small town and chose to continue to live that way long term uh, yeah four kids wife those are all the important things <laughs> yep. and then once in a while I get a chance to go hunt typically it's with a bow yeah. and uh, mule deer mule deer unless an elk cross on my path that's the, for the freezer right yep yep that's right all righty guys so we might do a second episode with Justin talking about some of these other fantastic deer that he has harvested. But today we're going to focus on this guy right here. As all of you know, uh, this is the Gordon Buck. It was harvested in like uh, September of 2018. Um, tell us a little bit, the scoreable points, inches, all that kind of stuff about this deer right here. Okay, so first of all, I didn't name it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was all done for me. Yeah. Once we decided, but scoreable inches uh, or, or points, 47 scoreable points when they got down to the nitty gritty. And um, 338 and 7 eighths net, 348 and 5 and eighths gross. Goodness. And uh, I don't remember some of the details. I have the score sheet. I should look at it because it, you know, inside spread credit and things like that. But. Um, uh, the, I don't know. It's it's kind of it's a buck that's changed my perspective on a lot of things. I like to hunt mule deer because they have unique antler configurations, but um, I've never been like someone who, if you put a big typical next to a big non-typical, I would probably chase the typical. And um, so I'm glad there wasn't a big typical next to him because I wouldn't even know what he yeah what he what he ended up being. Uh, but uh, it's changed my perspective because I thought I liked unique antlers, but the more I, time I spend around that deer and then I see people that try to categorize it one way or the other, then it makes me even, uh, it makes unique antler configuration even more appealing to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, because it is just such a freak. There are some angles I look at it and I'm like, ah, it doesn't even look that big. And then other days are angles and it's like, yeah, it's a crazy deer. <laughs> I heard, so a lot of things have come to my understanding since I killed this deer and people have debated how you should measure deer, right? And I heard, a, I heard one measurement test that some people advocate moving towards, which is water displacement. Yeah, you ever I've heard, heard that? about that as well, yeah. I'm like, I'm all for that. that would be really cool, really interesting because you're just talking about total mass and mule deer have some crazy, mm -hmm. right? And so you would take what we now consider a really pretty 238 inch that's got a few extra kickers but it's pretty spindly right and who knows that that's not going to displace a lot of water yeah. right 
But you take a trashy buck, a troll, yeah, a troll. and just, just it's gonna displace a ton of water. I mean, you look at all the crap that this thing has going on, and you're like, that's going to displace some water. You take the Broder buck, and just how crazy massive yeah. it is, that's going to displace some water. But some of the bucks that that I find really appealing, like a, just a, a 194 inch perfect typical that are just so pretty, um, that's not gonna move a lot of water around. Although it's still a really cool deal. Oh yeah. Shoot that first day for the rest of my life. <laughs> yeah, so would I actually. Alright, so here we go. 2018. Okay? Yeah. First day you get in the backcountry. Tell us about the first day you get there. So the first day I get there, the downside was that was Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So it was five days after the hunt started. If I got my Yeah. Yep. And um that's the, that's the first time that's ever happened. Uh, in 12 years, I think, I've never missed an opening day of the, of the Colorado archery season. Usually a week or two prior to that, to that you have the Utah opener for archery mule deer. Mm -hmm. And, um, but this year just uh, with my son leading to serve a church mission in Guatemala, uh, literally a couple of days after the Colorado, I knew when he opened that envelope, I was like, oh, man. Timing is not, <laughs> not, not good, and and just his report date. And I, I knew as soon as he read it, I was like, "Yeah, that's after the opener." So anyway, we get in five days after, um, and it was kind of skewampus from the get go. I had been in a couple of times, um, to and, scout. yeah, and I knew where I wanted to be on opening morning. Even though I hadn't seen really anything scouting, I just, you know, you, you have places that you, yeah, that you, you, you get a feel. I mean, there have, been, there have been years when I haven't turned up anything of real, you know, consequence scouting, but I knew where I wanted to be opening morning, and either that morning or within four days I had found something, right? Because scouting, it's not like I get to go live there for a week. Most of my scouting trips, I leave on a Thursday night from work, drive all night, I'm hiking in basically all day Friday. Hopefully I get some glassing in Friday night, Saturday morning, Saturday night, wake up Sunday and hike out to get back to work. So it's really tough to cover a lot of country with a bunch of little trips like that. But you get a feel for where you want to be and the, and the lay of the land and, and kind of the nooks and crannies that you can't see on Google Earth. So anyway, hadn't seen anything during scouting season. Knew where I wanted to be opening morning. But by the time I was getting in there, I had a friend that was already in there. And he had sent me a couple of text messages from his Garmin inReach and said, it's not good. So we kind of shuffled the deck, changed our game plan for where we were going to be. And um, my first day of actually having, being on the mountain with the tag in hand was Thursday, almost a full week after the opener. Okay. And there wasn't a whole lot doing. I mean, uh, found a couple of okay bucks that my other friend, you know, I, I would, I would be stoked for him, and honestly, there were a couple in there that, that was, they were big deer, but um, uh, if you go after those deer, you lose the rest of the adventure that could happen if you just hold out, right? Yeah. So, so I wasn't really interested, even though there were some okay deer there, and then uh, later that afternoon, it was another one of our, it was the friend that had been there all week, had covered the ground with glass from sunup to sundown, that actually spotted this buck um, that day, the, my first day in. But he was on a different ridge, and it was really interesting because he knows the country well. Mm -hmm. He had been, and he can find mule deer as well as anyone. And had, and like I said, he hadn't turned anything up, and so he found the deer. Uh, what was it? Five, six, seven days after the opener. Um, What's next? You want me to keep going? So yeah, so I guess we'll keep going. So your buddy classes up the deer. Yep. This is the first day you're in there, almost seven days after the Colorado opener. Yep. So day two, what happens day two? So day two, and I kind of talk about this a little bit in the, in the story in Western Hunter, but uh, I'll give some more detail because that format is very limiting. I, I really like reading stories in Western Hunter. I've never had a desire to write one myself, and given the opportunity to do it again, I might pass off the opportunity just yeah. because 
I, I, uh, when I first text the editor, I was like, how many words do you want for this thing? Because I didn't have any perspective. I'd never done a word count for any article that I'd ever read. Yeah. And he's like, oh, hopefully no more than 2,500, preferably somewhere in that 2,000 to 2,200 range. And when I got that text message back, I was sitting on over 9,000 words. Because I thought I was telling the story, yeah. right? So there's a lot of details left out. But uh, second day, so the first day, as we are headed back to camp, my friend who, um, I mean, he's a, he's a beast physically, just a specimen, mm -hmm. and uh, spends a ton of time doing hard things in the backcountry. And uh, he had driven most of the night before and let me sleep. Uh, he, would, he had a lot of caffeine and other foreign substances that he's usually not consuming to get us through the drive the night before. And so the lack of sleep and all of the crap in his gut, I think it caught up to him because we were, it was noon the first day we were in. Uh -huh. One friend's up on this ridge, you know, mile and a half, two miles away, we're over here. And we're like, ah, let's go back to camp, regroup and decide where we're going to go this evening. And it was before noon and he went down on both knees and started vomiting and passed out. I thought we were going to have to drop out. I was like, this hunt's over. We're, we're, we just hiked in, yeah. we've had a total of maybe six hours of daylight, and we're headed back down, we've got to drop elevation. Dang. And uh, selfishly, I was grateful when he was like, oh, let me see if I can ride this out for a few hours, and if I get feeling better, we won't go down. On the other, on the flip side, I was, I was thinking, <laughs> you don't want to play with altitude sickness. Yeah depending on what's going on there. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, he, he was pretty adamant that he just waited out. So fortunately, the next morning he was feeling a little better. He had spent all the rest of our first day in the backcountry just laying under a shade tarp, throwing up all day. Um, and then he started to feel better, he wasn't quite ready to go out the next day, he wanted to recover. And so the next day, my friend who had spotted the deer took me over and uh, as, as the sun came up, we found the buck. And I think he was nocturnal, I, or, or something had changed. Whatever the case, you know, he hadn't been spotted before. And then um, based on his, the way he acted, you know, you have that, that gray, gray light before there's any sunlight. And, and as, soon as, as soon as you started to get real light, but before the sun had actually hit the mountain or hit the drainage, he would start heading for the exit. And so before there was real sunlight in the drainage, he was down in the thick timber. And that's basically what, what we watched him do for the first four or five days, whatever it was. So you sat up there and watched him for four days? I think it was. I think I either killed him on the fourth day or the fifth day. We'd have to do a quick count. But, but every day he did the same thing, and he didn't let any sunlight hit his butt. So right in the morning, he'd dive straight towards the pines and just disappear, and then you'd maybe catch a glimpse of him the last two or three minutes of light in the evening? Or did no, you ever see him never seen him again. Because I spent, for all of those days, I would watch him dive off, and I would spend the rest of the day just seeing if I could get an angle to glass him up in the timber, or just wait for the sun to go down. So it's pitch, stuck. pitch black and there's nothing. And, I was just hoping I could pattern him coming out and see if the wind was right. And then maybe and I would it. drop in and wait for him to come out the next night, right? But that didn't ever happen. <laughs> the first day that we were up there, so that, that, that first morning that I actually hunted him, uh, my friend, who's, who's uh, he's a great mule deer hunter with a bow, knows when to go and when not to go. And I think that's the key. He's patient when he has to be patient, and then he... He's aggressive when he has to Yeah, and that's, I think, the mistake most people make mule deer hunting with, mm -hmm. a, with a bow and arrow, um, is you're, you either have to be at full speed or you have to be like almost moving so slow that your movement's imperceptible, right? And there's no in-between, and I think most people get caught in their mind second-guessing where they're going and how they're going about it, and then they're yeah. moving at half speed. And um, so anyway, when we're watching this deer and he was pretty excited about it, he's like, you've got to go now. And I'm like, dude, you're crazy. 
right? But I trust your opinion. <laughs> so I actually dropped and went in, but you know, the, the signals were if one, one, two game bags over the tripods that we were using the glass meant that he was still where he was when I left. One game bag meant he was moving and I needed to look back up in glass to see which way and get some hand signals and two game bags gone means that he's out, he, he dropped off. Because in Colorado you can't use radios, correct? I don't know what the rules are on radios in Colorado. But play but I think safe, you're right. play it safe, yeah. game bags. Yeah, so, so I just drop in, the only thing I have are my five fingers in my pocket um, and then I didn't even take my eights. I was like, look, I'll look at the ridge, it was a bad idea. The only thing I could tell looking up at the ridge is whether or not there were game bags. There was no way I was ever going to get a hand signal because I left my eights, my twelves, I was like just fast and light. All I had was my rangefinder to look, which is six power and it's hazy as hell. So, so um, I got down there and I got about 200 yards from his last known position, turned around and looked up with my rangefinder, no game bags. So came back out and I found out later that night, my buddy went off. He, he was leaving out on Saturday, had to leave. He actually killed a, a good buck that day after the little fiasco in the morning. And then he came back to camp late that night and we were kind of catching up under the stars. And he said, yeah, it's uh, that deer. There wasn't an animal in the drainage that got spooked. They all just moved off of their own accord. So I felt good about that. I hadn't blown them out. The wind stayed right the whole time. So that was that, that was day two. But the pattern stayed the same uh, for the next several days. First thing in the morning, bombing off in the camp. He's gone, yep. Like that gray light where you can start to see their outlines and then probably to the point where you could start to make out which buck it was and he was already. Yeah, and then he's moving and then you're watching him and you know exactly which buck is which. Um, and then, so like how many bucks was he with? Uh, I can't remember. remember. Yeah, there was. There were always like um, six to seven other bucks. Dang. Well, um, were there any that were like pretty good with him? No, there. I mean, they went from little like fork horns to maybe, maybe something in the 150 class. I'm not a good judge, but they were small there. Yeah. Uh, I think one of them was kind of appealing to my other buddy, so it may have cracked 160, 65. But um, so. Yeah, these deer, they would hang out, but they followed. He was always the first off. Um, and, and so the way I describe it, there's kind of a valley mm -hmm. and the sun's coming up. And then there are these massive mountain peaks, right? And the first sunlight that you see is on a mountain peak over yonder as it's coming up over these mountains here. And just that top peak would start to get some sun and then it would slowly come down, but it's still gray light, you know, and there's, it's still, the, the drainage is starting to fill up with light and as soon as that far peak would catch sun by that time he was moving and he was off so he was pretty um, he was smart yeah he was pretty jumpy that dude <laughs> I, I mean there's so many little things that happen right in in those moments that you're glassing and you're trying to figure out whether to go or not to go and gosh, if he's going to do this every single day, maybe I'm going to have to just take my chances and drop in early, early and cut him off. But he was in different areas all the time every morning, right? But he would always exit within a certain, about a 50 to 100 yard window of this, of this draw, right? Did that. And uh, so there's kind of a flat and then it just drops off into nasty stuff and about a 100 yard wide gap in that flat is where he would go off but you couldn't get ahead of him because the way you would think that those thermals would be coming up until the sun got down in there and heated that air up but the way the canyon is situated and the way it bends and the way the shelf of those whatever it was he had wind in his nose to go off there every single morning Dang. so it was kind of a it was a tough situation and I've I've patterned other mule deer that I thought I just had opening morning I was like that thing is dead. And the only thing that changed and the reason I didn't ever kill the deer was because for whatever reason the wind was a little different and they weren't following their nose into the same area. They totally changed their pattern based on you know where they could go following their nose. And that's what I'd this like, guy did. Yeah, I'd like to do some research and see like later in the year, obviously the temperatures swing and change, how much that wind, the wind channels and funnels changing certain canyons. Yeah. Because this guy had it figured out. Every single morning it was the same thing. 
And there are only a few places in that canyon where you could do that because of the way where he would have the wind in his nose to drop off into that timber in the morning. Um, and I, the, I don't know why I didn't realize this earlier, but there are a couple of other deer that have gotten away from me in years past. One that, that, that we call basket case. And different drainage, but the same exact situation. Looking back, it's like there, because of the way things are situated, he had a little bit of an updraft there that he could feed and follow his nose into cover. But um, the difference was on the day that I actually was able to get in on him, he started the day higher because I was looking in this, you know, I don't know, it's like this, it's like five football fields worth of, you know, trying to figure out where he is. Not finding him, not finding him, not finding him, not finding him. I'm like, ah, oh, the sun's going to be up in a second. We're done. I don't know where he's at. He was way up on this slope, higher than we had ever found him. And not only that, but all the other deer were probably 75 yards below him when I saw him. And by the time I saw him, I didn't see him stop. I finally picked him up and he was working his way down off the slope. And he, usually I watch them browse their way into cover. This dude, for whatever reason, it appeared to me looking at him that he mm -hmm. knew he was caught out. Yeah. He was higher than he had been at any other time. Caught his pants down. Yeah, and so, and he, I mean, not that he knows we're there. I don't know, maybe he does. Just that sixth sense, but whatever. He just beelined it. I mean, he went straight past every other deer in the drainage. And he was heading straight over to his, his head to, down. To his yeah, head. to his exit. He was just walking. I mean, he wasn't jogging. He wasn't, but he was just walking. He wasn't browsing along the way. And, and he got about literally 75 yards. I don't know. I, I want to go back and kind of shoot these ranges. But he got about 75 yards from his exit. And a wicked crazy front had moved in in another adjacent drainage. And you could see it and the clouds and the wind and everything got crazy and the little bit of rain that was falling just a mist um, turned to sleet and then turned to this really crazy snow like the light light snow where there's just a few flakes floating down and as soon as that happened the front moved over that ridge a little bit through a little bit of a gap and the wind i watched the snowflakes that were starting to fall just immediately all just abruptly start blowing straight into his butt. And he Game just, yeah, and he just stopped. Like, like stone, I'm watching snowflakes from 1,200 yards, you know, you're just watching the snow in the mm -hmm. air, and you're watching where the snow's falling and what it's doing, and, and as soon as that, that front moved and pushed wind at his back, he and all the other deer just stopped. And he sat there and chewed his cud, and I was like, and standing, like not like laying down, not browsing, just standing in one place, chewing his cud. And that happened, that went on for 30 minutes. And I was felt like, like three hours. Oh yeah. And I was like, oh, I guess this is my chance, right? This isn't going to, this is, and, and by that time he had created about 150 yards of separation. And there was a tier between where he was and a shelf and the other deer. And so I don't think it took me 20 minutes, if that, to drop elevation and sprint across this, because he's out of my sight. He can't see me and I sprint across the flat and that's the full speed or no speed. And my only objective was to make sure that those deer saw me because he couldn't see them either, right? It just, the wind shifted at just the, I mean, you know, those are things you can't control. Stars align. Yep, stars align exactly. And uh, the deer could, these deer couldn't see him. They could just see me, and they watched my entire approach, right? And finally, they moved off. And then it's just one on one, which you never get that situation. Yeah. yeah. Especially in the huge, huge, <laughs> huge basins, right? Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. show yeah. up. And there was a, um, my point was this massive, you know, it was, I, I've Google Earthed it several times. I think it was 12 or 1400 yards. I'd have to look at the Google Earthing again. But my point was a pretty big outcropping. I mean, it was about the size of like a small office building. So that's what you were working towards. You yep. saw that 
that yep. big rock. And he's, I'm going he's on this side of it and down, and I'm going to come here and creep up over it, and I'll be above him, right, so to speak. And I got to the outcropping, dropped my boots, got everything ready, put on my stocking shoes. And then I started to go, because my plan was, I was going to go follow the outcropping down, right? And then poke out around it at the bottom. And he'd be down And here. he'd be right there, almost at my level with the shot. Okay. But I would have the wind pushing this way the whole time. My wind would so be... So you'd be perpendicular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right? But I'm, I'm starting to move down the outcropping and there's no wind. I can't feel anything. So I test it and it's just this faint, faint wind coming. It's kind of switched back to its normal thing, right? It's not a full blown thermal because it's not like coming up in your face, but the faint wind that there was, was moving back. So I was like, well, he's, for all I know, he's gone yeah. because now he has the wind. So uh, I moved up over the rock and down. Wrapped over the top of it. Yep, yep. And, and, and just kind of crab crawled over the rock and just little tiny increments trying to catch a view. And no. that's like the slow part. Yeah. So there's no in between. Cause like I, I don't know where he's at. So I'm like, yeah. nothing, nothing. You're nothing. playing it as if he's like still within 50 yards, right? Yeah. Cause the last time I, his last known location, I thought that, you know, I didn't, I had to be within a hundred yards. And, uh, those are good questions because I kind of get, I skip parts, but I got over there and I was like, he's gone. Either that or he's staring at me. He's bedded in something thick right there and I can't see him and he's just got me pegged. And so I took a few steps. Now what happened is this outcropping was kind of nice and I could creep over here. And then it, on the other side of it, it dropped away hard. So I stayed right up against the rock in the shadows and just kind of moved down. And before I knew it, I had this, there's a rock face right up against my back. And I was looking up at just a sheer rock wall that extended probably 20 feet above my head, right? And I'm looking down here at where I thought the deer would be. And it's just thick, dense willows. And then I've got this side hill out in front of me that's willows about knee deep is all. So I have no cover out in front of me and I'm sitting there and I'm like, yeah, he's gone. And then his antlers come out from behind a shrub. So you're back against the wall here. Yeah. And he comes from left to right. No, he comes right out. Like, I'm like, how did I see that? There's this rock. There's like this little, another smaller outcropping about the size of a, you know, a big Car, SUV. Yeah. yeah. And then some trees on top of it and then a bunch of shrubs and all of a sudden he just like materialized through these shrubs like there's an antler and then there's his face and then I'm like oh my gosh and he's 80 yards and he's walking straight towards me and I'm just up against this rock like this ranging him and he's 80 yards and you have an arrow knocked you're ready to go yeah I do I do have an arrow knocked but I did not want an 80 yard shot on yeah, this no, 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 no. especially if someone walking yeah so he's so no sooner does he materialize out from behind these bushes and he just like plops down and starts chewing his cut and I'm like, you're kidding me, I got nowhere to go. Because it's just like knee high crap out that way. And so I range his antlers, he's, he's still right there at 80 yards. I'm like, okay, I can wait this out and if the wind busts me, it busts me. But if I wait it out, he stands up and, and starts to move or all, you know, whatever. Just kind of looking at the train and seeing where I can move, what I can do. And I actually ended up laying down and I was glass, so I pulled up my eights because this time I took, your took my stuff. Yeah. And this is the whole reason I purchased these because I love my 12s on my tripod. And they are good offhand occasionally, but having a little set of eights for when you're on a stock or when you just want to glass something and get a big field of view. Um, they're money. Yeah, they are. Yeah. So, so I had my eights, and by this time I had just laid down against this side heel that's kind of basically about this angle right here, and I'm just glassing him. And you can't really see, it's 80 yards, but it's still, it's just antlers and stuff, right? And so what I was most interested in is eye level. And the shrubs that he had laid down in, if those were the shrubs, his eyes were right at that level. 
So I was pegged. I mean, had he just been a little bit deeper, I could have just walked around and shot him. But his eyes were at a level where he could he see everything. But every once in a while, he would turn his head, and from the back, his antlers looked like they come together like that. And so as I was laying there, he turned his he turned his head. So I'm in this. There's this same little bulk, you know. SUV size outcropping with some trees and some shrubs and I realized that I've only got to make it a few more shimmies to the my right and that same outcropping is going to block his view of me and um, uh, it wasn't for whatever reason that wasn't apparent mm -hmm. until I was in that situation and then I could see what was working out um, and so that's what happened few more turns of the head, because he was just chewing his gut. He wasn't like sleeping. And I have no idea why he did not go off the edge once that wind shifted back. I mean, it's, again, these are all things that, it's just pure yeah. luck, mm -hmm. right? And then you just hope that the one thing that you're in control of goes right, because everything else has, yeah. and you're just lucky as all get out. And so the one last shimmy to the right, I had this, now I literally just stood up walked around over on top of that outcropping. And I had the, some, the, car the same one, the same one. The trees. So the same one that he's bedded by. The same one that he walked out from behind and bedded down, and the same one that blocked him, that I ultimately got between he and I, I walked around right up on top of it, and he's right over here now, right? And there are two evergreens right at the end that are about, you know, I don't know, 10 feet high, and then some jack pines over here. And I just peer out from behind one and I can see that nasty right antler. And I'm like, 26.3 yards. <laughs> <laughs> and the pressure was on. Because I talked about, in, again, in the article, I have, that deer, I think I stood in one place for two hours and waited for him because I had a massive thermal. And so I literally stood and I was numb from the knees down because I didn't move. He was, he just needed to give me a shot, but he wasn't moving the afternoon. Um, anyway, so I've, by the time the shot situation presented itself, it was almost anticlimactic. Same with that one. I'm crawling through a rainstorm. I've got one boulder between me and him in this relatively flat opening. And, and uh, by the time I actually the shot presented itself so much time had elapsed during the stock that the shot was just like go through the process get it done right um stone cold killer but this dude you come around and boom right there i had been i mean the stock had still i had been in there you know inside of 80 yards now for over an hour and um my adrenaline had not dropped because i was like that's a crazy antler that I'm ranging right now, right? I really don't want to mess this up. This yeah. would be something, there are a couple of deer that haunt me to this day, right? And this is not one that I want to have haunt me because no. this has all gone so Just look at that, right? Anyway. It's just all gone so well. And um, so I just, I, I spent, I mean, it's like, okay, here's the pine trees and they're about almost halfway between me and him. And so I'm like, okay, like, archery line right i'm like line up my <laughs> literally i'm like well, what else am i going to do to calm my nerves i'm just going through everything okay right okay and then i'm like this and all of that stuff that i was doing by this time whatever something had caught his attention so he stood up and as soon as he did i just saw his antlers do the the nod yeah like and I'm i just up. came to full draw so your sight on your bow, yeah. what kind of sight is it? Is it a single pin slider or no, is it a three pin slider? I use, I've used all of the above. I'm a big fan of the five pin slider. Okay. Because I've so, had way too many situations where <laughs> you need, and, and I set my pins, this is what's so, it's almost like serendipitous. It's like years and years ago, I either read something or playing around with uh, my friend's hooter shooter or archer's advantage, I decided that the best top pin is not to go 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 with a five pin sight. I decided that 27 yards was the best yardage for a top pin. 
Oh, so you put your top pin right on it. Yeah, so my top pin is exactly so like yard. For like, yeah, for like, uh, I've got to say eight years, my top pin has been 27, my second pin is 40, 50, 60, 70 is the bottom of the slider, right? Okay. So again, this is just pure serendipity. Everything literally all on Because <laughs> that's why when I ranged him at 26.3 yards, I'm like, no way. <laughs> like, it you're, is old. You're like, I'll take half a step back. <laughs> right. And then the other funny thing is going back to, because my friend had been in, you know, for five, six days by the time we actually arrived, and we get in via headlamp because we had hiked all day to get into base camp. And, you know, I see his headlamp and, you know, I hadn't seen him in a while. We walk up and hugs and he's, and this going back to when we first got in and he's like, how's it going, man? And I had had an interesting summer of school and preparing for my son to leave. And you guys have been down here. I'll shoot my basement all winter long, blind bail. And I really actually enjoy that with an evolution release and I'll just shoot and just go through the process. And um, so before a hot, like, from like the, when the hunt ends till the next one starts, you probably shoot your bow a million shots. I, I enjoy it. I don't know how many shots I get through it because there are days. At least three days a week, right? Well, if I'm home, I shoot the bow every single day. Um, so, but it had been a fairly uh, crazy summer. Crazy summer. So it's not like a normal summer where I'm getting off, you know, 15 to 30 quality shots every day before the hunt and sometimes more than that, right? But really quality, like one arrow at a time type of crap. Uh, that wasn't the case. So when we got into camp, I was like, I'm deadly to 26 yards. That's what I told them. <laughs> so no, I sold them 27 yards because that was my top pin. And whatever it was, it was close enough. So, and that's exactly when I ranged him at 26.3 yards, I'm like, my mind is flashing back to I'm deadly to 27 yards, A, and B, why in the world? It was all about the trajectory of the arrow and why I wanted my top pin to be 27 and my second pin to be 40, and I could shoot the gap from anywhere from 10 yards to 35 yards. I knew where I wanted to hold that 27 yard pin, and then I could just, and then, it, then the 40 yard pin. So I decided that years ago, and for this deer to show up, for this to work out that way, right? So anyway, I had nothing to do to calm my nerve besides pretend I'm on the archery line. So the first thing, go through the process. I'm like, okay, my feet are lined up. Open stance, literally like shoulders back, top posture, the whole thing, right? And then he just nods his head like on cue and I'm like, Phew. but in that moment, yeah, as is always the case, something's wrong. Right at the end of the outcropping, there's this bush that he didn't clear, when he stood up down below at that lower level, because I was standing with him in his bed. Well, when he stood, I think I was at antler level. So I was quite a bit elevated above him. His antlers were probably about level with my feet when he stood. And there's an out, there's a shrub right at the end of the outcropping and he's quartering away. And I'm like at full draw going in front of the shrub, shrub shoulder, back of the shrub liver, and all this happens in seconds or split seconds. Yeah. But that was the decision that I hadn't anticipated that I had, everything was good about my shot sequence and my posture and everything like that. Right. If I were on an archery line, but there's a shrub at the end of the outcropping. Mm -hmm. So it, it almost, there aren't a lot of photos that show it, but it, it's almost like the liver shot, the 14 ring on a 3d target. That's basically the shot that I had. In fact, if I were to set up a 3D shot at a 3D range for this buck, for what I had, it would be hard quartering away. And basically you've got cover and the only, your only option to score on that target is the 14 ring. I think that's what they are. I'm not a big 3D guy. So that's basically, I was like, okay, I'm gonna slide this because he's quartering away. I'll slide it right in that back. I'll hit his liver. I'll hit his offside lung. We'll be good. And ultimately that's all of that happened in probably less than two yeah, seconds. Two right? steps. And then I just pull, press, pull, press, pull. His and legs it, kick. Oh Boom. it was um, there were a couple of moments where I was like because I had switched 
to the Valkyrie system. Mm -hmm. So I haven't shot fixed blade broadheads for 12 years until this year. Um, and, and in a liver situation, you want a big mechanical motion. <laughs> you would think. <laughs> but what was interesting is, so, you know, every one of these deer, total pass-throughs, I've never had a problem. Well, that deer, because he was hard quartering away, it actually went in his and... far shoulder. Um, yeah, it stuck in his far shoulder, but it buried. I mean, it went all the way through him, because he was hard quartering away too. All the way up, stuck in his far shoulder, but I got everything good. He only went like 40 yards straight down the hill and then. But um, this deer, the arrow, with that Valkyrie system and that heavy front of center, I think I'm pushing like 20% FOC, which isn't what I started out wanting, but by the time I got through building my setup, I was like, well, that's cool. I got 20% FOC, let's see how it performs. It performed great. But the way the arrow sounded going through the willows on the other side, it was like I didn't even hit the buck. Because every other deer, you hit them with a mechanical, that mechanical hits the dirt on the other side and it's like tumbling. Or like a, it's like a like judo tip. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's basically what it does on the other side, right? It's not just ripping through willows like it's not touched any flesh. And I was like, I didn't hit, there's no way I missed that deer. But the way the arrow sounded going through the willows on the other side, there was that split second and then I saw the spot and I was like, oh yeah, he's hit, right? But there was that split second where I was like, that sounded like I missed him. Because it just went through so yeah, fast. Yeah, like just when you shoot almost like a close shot with a muzzleloader rifle, it's like, like right behind it, like through the trees. Yeah. Like, what the heck? Yeah. And there wasn't that like, you know, you, you pop, sound. you've popped the lungs or you've heard those mechanicals the hit. Flat. Like, yeah. The, no, man. this was just, that's what I remember hearing. It's just that arrow ripping through trees on the other walls. side. Yeah. So, Fortunately, a few seconds later, he's hot. He's like hopping out, and I see the spot, and I'm like, okay. Now, did I judge the angle right? Because I definitely got liver on the onside, right? I ultimately he went downhill about 120, 150 yards. Because from the kill site, from the from the site where he died, I was able to range back up to the shrubs where the trees that I that he was at when I uh, shot him, and uh, it was like 140 yards straight downhill. I mean and then he tipped over and it had worked out i had no guts i got his liver his onside lung was perfect pink pink bubble, bubbles on the exit um again just so many lucky things happened uh in the way this all went down with this deer but um and then i i honestly i went down but made my way down and uh he had when he he kind of went down and then because of the way he was hit he laid down and then he kind of went like this and you know he he didn't like tumble he laid down and expired and his head and antlers were all up in these shrubs and everything and i just went down and looked at him and walked around him and i was like i can't believe this kind of poked him with my other broadhead set my bow down took off all my face mask and everything i don't like face paint because whatever reason I just sweats runs off gets all over yeah and so I really like face masks the tight ones um, and I just leave a you know a little slit and I practice a lot like that in the summer to make sure I don't have anything hanging up but um, I think taking making sure they can't see your hands and your face everybody talks about that so anyway I take all that crap off I go back up get my boots on which they're another whatever plus yards up and uh, and then I spent the next hour plus looking for my arrow. I still don't, I mean like, there's two things. I'm going on a backpacking trip as soon as the snow's off and I'm looking for my arrow and I'm going to get his lower jaw so I can eat his tooth. I have no idea like, of all the things that I was like just trying to shave weight off, I'm like, oh, we'll just take the lower jaw off. I know right where it's sitting as long as something hasn't drug it off. But um, my arrow didn't ever get found. I'm totally bummed about that because I really, really want that arrow. Um, but then my friend came down. He had the backpacks and all the gear up there with him. He came down and pulled it out of the trees. And Dang. Speechless. We'll, we'll insert some, uh, some of the recovery photos. Um, 
But we're gonna we're gonna do another video with Justin, talking about his gear setup, his arrow builds, his favorite boots, his favorite camo, what he packs in his pack, what he leaves at his pack, what he takes with him on his stocks. We're gonna do all that sort of stuff in the next video. But um, basically, we got just, our goal done. This just, video was about that gear. So what yeah, else do you guys want to know about the deer? I mean, I can't wait to do because I geek out on deer. I yeah. really do. And there are a lot of people that do, you know, but I... Um, Down to the grain, right, on your arrows? I've seen, uh, I've seen you ride on your fletchings before. Unfortunately. I mean, it doesn't do anything. It's just kind of... Mental. For me, it's peace of mind. The way... My, my food list is the same way. Down to the calorie? I really get into calories and fats and, and macronutrients and then I'll pack in some veggie powders and craps to try to get some micronutrients uh, and some real greens, if you will. But anyway, I could talk about all that stuff all day. What about, um, is there anything else you guys want to know about this thing? We'll, we'll get some different shots and angles of this buck, but... Oh, I know. I mean, most people by this time know this. But the whole time we were glassing, every time all day that we're glassing this deer before he disappears, every day, not all day, um, we're like, something, he jumped a fence and got his nuts ripped off, or what, yeah, let's what, talk about what is this. up? So right? he's, he had his... Yeah, that was, the, that was the first thing. So when my buddy got down there, I grabbed his hind legs and I'm like, well, that doesn't explain anything. That, right? That because what's the next thing he did? It was the full thing. So you're like, oh, he's got injured, right? Well, that's the thing is, so when we're caping him, we took him apart from head to toe, right? And there's nothing like I was expecting like infection. Like yeah, he got all water. jacked up. I mean, he was good. Dang, right? so that's just all genetic. Well, it, there was, there, I mean, you know, Ryan Hatfield, the editor for Western Hunter oh. Magazine, I mean, he knows mule deer pretty well, and he in this in this uh, issue, he talks about the fact that um, there are some things you can't describe, right? Yeah. Which is yeah, that's right, Hatfield. I knew that. So, and this is kind of one of those undescribable things because if you look right through here, let me grab a camera, and you compare him to a lot of other deer, and that's what's been so interesting to me is. Some people are like, oh, he's a stag. And I'm like, yeah, you're right, he's a stag. And then, I'm, and then other people are like, no, he's not. And I'm like, yeah, you're right, he's not. And I don't really know. Because I've seen typicals that have eye guards and crap just like this, right? But his bases and his antlers and the veins that feed the antlers, all of that is just normal. It doesn't have that big, gnarly build up of garbage that you see on a lot of, on a lot of uh, stag deer. And then you get, but basically you get right out to here where he forks and that's where things get funky. And so he definitely had something going on. His nose is a little bit off. You know, he's got a little bit of that, that um, kind of almost doe nose. Versus it's not really a real big Roman nose, right? Well, he's got a yeah. fat nose on it, but the color of it is a little different than you would see on most bucks. Like, these guys get that gray look. I mean, this dude was killed within a few days, and they all shed at different times. There, But this, this, you know, five, six years earlier, this guy was killed within a few days of when this one was killed. But you look at the coloration on their face and their nose, totally different. So there are aspects that this deer has but as far as shedding antlers, when you look at the way these are configured, a lot of guys look at it really, they're like, no, this deer shed his antlers. The taxidermist felt that way. He's like, no, this deer shed, right? Let me put a couple things to rest real quick. Sorry. No, you're good. So I don't know what this, but people speculate and I'm like, the same bro science that explains that it's not a stag is used to explain that it is a stag and there's no explanation. Yeah. So from what I've talked to, what I've done my research on, on stag deer, um, they won't have pedicles like this. They'll go sh grow straight into the skull. Okay? This deer obviously has pedicles, bases just like every other deer in this room, every other mule deer that sheds its antlers. Another big thing that I've learned is that mule deer that are not stag bucks, they won't have these defined veins like you see in most big mature, mature mule deer. 
This deer obviously has normal veins feeding out to its main beams in G2s, just like a normal deer would. So that leads me to believe that he shed his antlers, everything grows out, just like every other year in this buck's life. And sometime around this point, whether he ate something, drank something, got sick, got kicked in the neck, got kicked, <laughs> something, something out to this point, this deer <laughs> exploded. Yeah. So that's all I'm going to say on that. I'm no expert, but I have done extensive research in this. I do pick up a lot of sheds. I do enjoy researching mule deer. And until you come and look at this deer in person, and I have a picture of a stag buck I'll put next to this, and compare the bases and the antler configuration to a stag deer, don't tell me that this is a stag deer just from pictures that you see on the internet. But we cannot, <laughs> we cannot give a definite answer, yes or no. Regardless, this is 348 inches of antlers on a mule deer's head. 99% of us won't kill an elk that big in our lives. So, thank you Justin for, for letting us come down and bug you. We'll dig into your gear and uh, some of the stuff that you like to do and what you don't like to do and those kinds of things. But thanks for watching guys. Uh, comment below um, what your favorite part of the story was and leave a comment on what video you want to see next. Matt, it's fun to chat, man. Yes. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Thanks for giving me a chance Yeah. to uh, talk about it. For sure. Jed, it's good to have you over to the house once in a while. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah, and be watching this year. Justin and I oh, yeah. are going to be chasing some mule deer together. Matt and I are going to go chase some mule deer together here in Utah. Maybe, maybe it'll be Idaho. Maybe Idaho or Wyoming. <laughs> you never know, but. Waiting for some tags. Yeah, but that's the goal and it should be an epic.